struggled a little bit trying to figure out how to introduce our first speaker here today. Because anything that I could stand up here and say to the effect of, gee, it's been a wild election season, would be a heinous misunderstatement. Uh, as all of you undoubtedly know, there's been a huge amount of discontent and frustration with our electoral process on both sides of the partisan divide. Narayana Kocher-Lakola is a member of the faculty in our Department of Economics here at the university, uh, and he's here to talk a little bit about what might be causing that discontent. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker this afternoon, Dr. Narayana Kocher-Lakola. Thank you so much for that introduction, Nick. It's my pleasure, it's my honor to be here to commemorate this very special Meliora weekend with you. <clears throat> As Nick alluded, this has been a pretty wacky election season. And I think one of the things that's been most remarkable about it is the extent to which so many Americans have expressed their discontent and disengagement and disenchantment with the leadership of both political parties. So if we go back to the primaries, on the Democratic side, we had Senator Bernie Sanders, who won the votes of millions of Americans in the Democratic primary, finished a strong second to Secretary Clinton, and he's not even a Democrat. On the Republican side, Donald Trump won the nomination, obviously got millions of votes as well, without much in the way of support from the core leadership part of the Republican Party. So both on the Democratic side and the Republican side, we see, I think, strong disengagement, frustration with the leadership of both political parties. Now, where is that coming from? So I'm a professor of economics. So I'm going to talk to you about the economics of where the, uh, this sense of frustration, disengagement is coming from. So I'm going to start by talking through a chart. And this is a chart that's going to depict the evolution of the median income of white Americans, both male and female, over a time horizon of 2000 to 2015. Let me start by explaining why I picked that time horizon of 2000 to 2015. So it covers the time in office of two presidents, President Bush and President Obama. President Bush is a Republican. President Obama is a Democrat. We don't have the data for 2016. That's why we stopped, uh, stopped in 2015 here. So that's why we, I'm, I'm uh, covering the years 2000 to 2015. Now I want to talk about what each of the dots represents here. So let's, let's pick, uh, say, uh, the blue dot uh, in 2012 for the men, white men. What you want to be imagining is we've ordered all the men in the United, white men in the United States from the highest earning to the lowest earning. And we're looking at the man who's right in the middle of that ranking. So half the people are, half the men, white men are above, half the white men are below. So that's what I'm going to mean by median. The other uh, piece that's going to be important here is that these are what economists call real incomes, or inflation-adjusted incomes. What that really means is, instead of just keeping track of the dollars that people are earning in each year, we're keeping track of what they can buy with those dollars. How many uh, goods and services, restaurant meals, that kind of thing, can they all out and actually get what the income they're earning? And one final piece about the chart before I actually go in to talk about what it, what it conveys to you. Uh, we're, I'm pretending that uh, in, uh, in the year 2000, uh, the middle person, uh, both middle male and the middle female, earned $1. And the reason I'm doing that is to convey to you how that dollar has grown over time as opposed to focusing exactly on how much they earned. Okay? So let's start with the green line. That's going to be the best news I'm going to have for you among all the four. I'm going to go talk through four demographic groups. <laughs> um, so the, what you see from that uh, in the green line is this, the description of what's happening to the uh, median woman, median white woman, in terms of their, their uh, income. And what we see is that in the year 2015, that median white woman is earning about 11% more than she did in 2000. 
So she can afford to buy 11% more goods and services in the year 2015 than she could in, in the year 2000. Now that is what, exactly what economists mean by growth, is that you can go out and buy more goods and services at the end of a given time horizon than you could at the beginning. It's not much growth. So 11% over uh, 15 years is less than a percent a year. Um, that's pretty slow by, uh, the stand by the standards of history in our country. And especially if you go back, say, to the, uh, the previous five or six years, you would, we would have seen much faster growth. But as I say, that's the best news I'm going to be able to convey to you. Because if we go to the blue line, the blue line is uh, depicting what's happened to the median white man in, over the same time frame. And that median white man is actually able to buy fewer goods and services in the year 2015 than he could in the year 2000. So we're not, act, we're not seeing growth here. We're actually seeing a diminution, a deterioration in living standards over this 15-year time frame. That is extraordinarily unusual over such a long time horizon in our, in our country to have that experience. So when you see these kinds of pictures, I don't think it's uh, that surprising that we should see a, a, a large amount of discontent and frustration in, uh, among people about the leadership of both political parties. Now, you might well ask, is it right to blame the president, be it Bush or Obama, for these outcomes? And it's true. The president has a limited number of levers to, to pull. But that's not really my point here. It's really like if you have a baseball team and the baseball team uh, starts to lose on the diamond, it's not all the manager's fault. But the manager is going to get a lot of the blame for it nonetheless. And I think that's exactly the kind of story that we, 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 can, we can see here. Now, I've shown what's going on for white Americans. Let me talk about black Americans. And again, you want to imagine the same exercise is being done here, as I described for, for, for whites, that if I pick a given year, say 2011, I'm ordering um, the, the black men, for example, from the highest earning to the lowest earning, and then looking at the person in the middle of that ranking. And what do we see? So let's look first at uh, black women, African-American women. They're earning, in real terms, slightly less in 2015 than they did in 2000. Again, not growth, um, and, and, and there's again very slow uh, improvement, in fact there's no improvement to be seen here uh, over this 15 year time horizon. The picture for black men is extremely disturbing. And I, 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 it shows in fact, as we saw for, for white men, a diminution in living standards over this 15 year time horizon. But it's a much larger fall in living standards than we saw for white men. It's a, uh, close to 10% for black men over this 15 years. That the median black man is able to buy close to 10% less in terms of goods and services in the year 2015 than he could in the year 2000. Now, uh, this chart represents, uh, I think, a little bit of a surprise in terms of the, the discontent and frustration that I pointed to earlier among voters, because black uh, Americans in the primaries voted very strongly for Hillary Clinton who is more the mainstream candidate of the Democratic Party. Uh, they didn't turn to Senator Sanders. They didn't turn to another candidate who might have been uh, speaking or, or talking more directly about how to, to uh, ameliorate these shortfalls. So all these data are eminently available to, to anybody who cares to look them up. They're in the, on the Census Bureau website. Anyone can, can look them up. So why is it that so many observers and so many policymakers, in particular uh, the, the, the establishment of both parties, were taken so much by surprise by the backlash that we had in the primaries of 2016. I can't answer that with certainty. But I can draw upon my own experience. So I'm very new to Rochester. I became a professor here on, in January. And the, for six years before that, I was serving as president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. What that means, among other things, is that I was on the Federal Open Market Committee, which helps to make monetary policy for the, for the United States. And one of my jobs, what you're supposed to do as a policymaker in that role is talk to a broad cross-section of Americans about how they are experiencing the economy. And that's what I you know, went out and did. I talked to, to many different Americans from all walks of life about how they're experiencing the economy. But the fact of the matter is 
that you're much more likely to end up talking to people who want to talk to you. There is a group of people who are desperate to talk to policymakers about how the economy is treating them. And you know what? Those people tend to come not from the middle of the income distribution, as the people we're talk we've talked about in these charts, but rather from the upper end of the income distribution. So let's draw a line. What, what do I mean by upper end of the income distribution? I'll draw a line. Uh, six figures, $100,000 a year in income. If you're talking about an individual who is earning over $100,000 a year in income, you're talking about someone who's in the top 10% or actually uh, higher than that in income distribution for any of these four demographic groups, white men, white women, black men, black women. If you're getting your feeling about what's going on in the economy mainly from individuals who are in that $100,000 a year or over um, income bin, you are getting a, a very different view of the economy than what you would get for talking to the people at the middle of the income distribution. Because people who are, who, are in, who are earning over $100,000 a year or more have done uh, very well during this 15-year time horizon relative to people in the middle. So that's, so that's, I think, a challenge for policymakers is to be talking not just to those, to the, uh, disproportionately to those who want to talk to them, but actually trying to reach out and talk to those and learning about the experience of those who may not be knocking on their door. So where do we go from here? Well, it's 2016. We'll have another election in 2020, 2024, 2028. If these kinds of charts do not change, we will have more disenchantment, more disengagement, more disappointment, and more frustration among our voters. And I, I think in this electoral cycle, that's been focused and concentrated among white men. But if these kinds of pictures continue to be true going forward, I would predict that that kind of uh, frustration would spread to these other demographic groups as well. So I think that really it behooves us to be thinking about you know, what can be done. So one reaction is nothing can be done. And you often hear that, it's sort of a, a, a sense that this is just outside the control of anybody and it's, it's uh, just bad luck. Uh, I, I certainly don't believe that. I think there are things that the government can do that can help boost growth in America, and that growth in America would start to tilt these charts in the right direction, upward as opposed to uh, sideways or downward. And we've heard both candidates have spoken about the importance of investing in infrastructure. That would be a help to these kinds of, of charts. But there's other ideas uh, that are on the table and uh, economists are coming up with all the time that would help to tilt these charts upward as opposed to, to downward. But the first step, before we can move on to talking about the solutions, is to recognize the problem. And I think the challenge there is what I, I alluded to earlier, that uh, it's easy for our policymakers in Washington to get stuck in talking to um, people who are only at the upper end of the income distribution and not connecting su uh, sufficiently with those who are in the middle of the income distribution. And if they're only talking to those at the upper end, they're going to miss why there's been such a backlash in the primaries and why there's been such a feeling of disengagement and disappointment among, among our voters. If they can reach out beyond that, that uh, bubble of, uh, of, of the higher income individuals, they can recognize there's a problem and we can start talking about solutions. Thank you. Nariana Coach Lakota.